Uh, my name is Debbie Crabtree. I'm here from Sikich. I'm an accounting services manager in the governmental team here at Sikich in our Naperville office. Uh, we're going to be covering payroll best practices this afternoon, and I'm joined by Joy Deuce, our senior managing director of HR consulting services out of our Milwaukee office. Hopefully you can all hear me and also see on the screen here we have our first slide, which is our introduction slide on payroll best practices. If you do have any issues with technology um, on your screen, there is a place to submit questions. Um, so if you have any technology questions or concerns, you can certainly submit them there. Um, also throughout the presentation, if you have any questions along the way, please submit those questions. I'll be speaking first on the first couple topics on the agenda, and then Joy is going to speak, and then we'll, we will address questions as uh, time allows. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and get started uh, on the agenda. Oh, I should also mention that the, there are code words throughout this presentation. As we move through the slides, there'll be code words. If you could uh, write those down after the webinar is over, there will be a survey. Of, an email will be sent to you with a link to a survey about the webinar. And you will also need to submit those code words in order to obtain a CPE and HRCI credit, which this webinar is eligible for. Okay, so on the agenda today, the first couple items I will be covering is our uh, payroll best practices and tax issues, the taxability of fringe benefits, preparing for year-end payroll and year-end payroll reconciliation. And then Joy is going to join us, and she'll cover the compliance and legal issues related to payroll. So starting off in the payroll best practices, uh, our first area are payroll systems and workflow. Uh, we encourage our clients and all companies um, to use an accounting system, which is integrating the payroll system with the general ledger. This will automate the employee deductions and the employer payroll taxes. Uh, having the general ledger linked with the payroll system will eliminate any concerns with the posting of the payroll transactions over to the general ledger for salary expense. Um, the payroll system also should be linked to the federal and state agency withholding table. Um, this will improve accuracy and compliance, um, any, and it will reduce any concerns of manual calculation. Uh, the other area that we um, encourage you to do is consider setting up several payroll bank accounts with a sweeping feature to the operating account. Um, what this does is that the payroll account uh, at the bank will be reduced every time a, a, a transaction is um, occurring within the payroll account. It will sweep money over from your general bank account. Uh, this, will, uh, this will make your bank reconciliation easier, as well as uh, it will reduce the number of transfers between your bank accounts. So if you're currently funding the payroll, every time there's a payroll and you're transferring money over into that payroll account, you may find that have you, as you're avoiding the checks that you are having to sweep money back and forth between them. Um, if you set up with your bank to do automatic sweeps, it may eliminate some of your transactions and make it more automatic at the bank. So we do encourage you to take a look at that. Uh, the next area is within the general ledger. We encourage you to set up separate uh, liability and expense accounts. Uh, in a perfect world, this would be zero at the end of each month. Each of your liability accounts would be zero. Uh, depending on timing, that may not that may not occur. If you have uh, if you're a governmental entity, which I know we have several on the line here today, uh, your IMRF payment technically isn't due till the tenth of the next month. So you may hold off on making that payment. And if that's the case, then your liability account would still have a balance in there after you run your payroll. There would be a balance at month end. Uh, but we do encourage you to have separate liability accounts based on deductions so that if, if there is a balance in that account and you need to research, it will help in researching that information. Uh, the next area of best practices is verifying that employees actually exist. I know several of you on the line are smaller entities, um, so it's not, as, it's not an issue as much as with our larger clients and some of the larger companies that are here joining us today. Um, what we do is, is we encourage you to match the employees with the Social Security numbers that, they prov that the new employee provides to you to the Social Security cards. Um, this will, there are two ways that you can verify this information. Uh, the first is on the 
uh, <clears throat> and the E-Verify system within the uh, Department of Homeland Security and Social Security Administration website. And there on the screen is the E-Verify website. And what this is doing is comparing the information that they've provided on the I-9 form, assuming they've provided that to you when they became a new employee, or even the employees that you currently have, if you'd like to flip back through your personnel files and take a look at uh, verifying this information. This will, uh, this will allow you to verify what they currently have at the federal government for each of your, each of your employees. The second verification service is through the Social Security Administration website. Uh, this allows you to enter the Social Security name online. You get immediate results matching up the information that the employee has provided to you. Also, if you wanted to do all of the employees at your company, you can upload up to 250,000 Social Security numbers and names and receive the results the next day from them. Um, what this will do if you, if you have a process in place as new employees come on board, or even if you have not done this in the past and you want to take advantage of this free service, this will, this will eliminate uh, in, uh, errors coming back from the federal government after you submit W-2s. Um, you may find that you have a new employee, maybe this has happened in the past where you have a new employee that comes on board, and then you issue their W-2 to them, and then by the time that information is confirmed and researched and looked at by the government, it's nine months to 12 months later, you receive a notice from the IRS telling you that the information you submitted on their W-2 is not accurate. Uh, so this is one way to try to cut off any possible errors as this um, as information is being submitted at the end of the year. Uh, the next area is time tracking. Uh, we do encourage you to have an electronic system in place to track the time for hours worked versus manual spreadsheets. Uh, whether this be um, cards that are being swiped to track, or the employees have the opportunity to log into the system and manually en uh, enter the hours, and then have a process in place where the supervisors can uh, review that information and approve it. Uh, and it, it, the approval really should come from a direct supervisor, someone that is uh, familiar with the hours that the uh, employees are working. Uh, versus a manual entry by a payroll clerk is that if these options are available to have this be automatic and the approval to be done by the direct supervisor, we do encourage this. <clears throat> we also encourage you to have implement checks and balances within the payroll department. Um, just like with um, most systems, whether it be payroll or general ledger or planning and development department, we do encourage every person who's logging into the system to be re uh, have their individual user IDs and to have restrictions to only be able to access the information that they need. Uh, and then the final comment related to checks and balances is the processing of payroll reports. Uh, those payroll reports should be reviewed by someone other than the person completing the process. Um, ideally, it would be someone who is familiar with, uh, the, familiar with the process but doesn't have access to themselves to run um, any ghost employees or to be able to know that John Doe out in the um, public works department um, didn't work 80 hours of overtime snow plowing in the middle of the summer. So somebody that can take an overall uh, look at what is occurring and make sure that the information is accurate, uh, we do encourage that to be done by someone other than the person who's actually processing. The next area are payroll tax issues. So the first slide here that we're looking at are considerations for those affecting Illinois employees. Now I know it's possible that we do have some of our Wisconsin uh, employees on the line. The first slide actually deals with federal information, so this would apply to you too. Um, but we do have most of this information here is specific to Illinois. If you have any questions about Wisconsin, we can certainly address those too. Um, the first is the federal side for employees um, and employers. Uh, they will be Social Security is 6.2% for 2015. Um, it is not changing as it had changed a couple of years ago for the employee side, back down, down to 4.2. That's been back up to 6.2 for a couple of years now. So it is 6.2% on Social Security. The 2015 witch base has been announced as $118,500. So you want to make sure that as you set up your system, 
uh, and you roll forward into 2015 and start processing your new payrolls, that you are updating your system to have that uh, wage base limit. No, it doesn't affect you right away in January, but several months in or, or come fall, you want to make sure that that information is in there so that Social Security is no longer taken on employees who are making more than that. Um, then we have Medicare, which is the 1.45% that has no wage base limit. Uh, we also have additional Medicare on the employee side only. It is 0.9% for over 200,000 in wages, and it is employee only. And um, that is, if you need information on that, definitely give us a call. If you have any questions on that, that went into effect a year or two ago. And um, that information is also based on filing status of the employee. So there are, there's more information behind this 0.9% if you have any questions. Uh, and then we have federal withholding, which is employee only, and that would be based on the allowances of how the employee uh, completes their W-4. So you want to make sure that that information is accurate if they do submit a new W-4P which they, or W-4, which they can do at any point in time uh, during the year. They can make a change. Um, more commonly, we'll start hearing from employees um, now until April 15th as they're meeting with their tax advisors and they determine they want more or less withheld from their checks throughout the year. Uh, that's usually when people, employees start submitting uh, new W-4s. Uh, and then the final section on this slide is related to the uh, employer federal unemployment insurance. Uh, that is 0.6% for 2015. And just to note, if you are a governmental agency, you should not be paying FUTA. Uh, if you are, then definitely give us a call so we can talk further. But there are certain types of organizations that this is not, FUTA is not applicable to. Okay, so the next section is on state taxes. Uh, the employee portion of state taxes, the Illinois withholding, will be based on the allowances that are submitted on the Illinois W-4. Uh, just breaking news in the last couple of weeks that the uh, Illinois tax rate, which had gone up to 5% um, a couple of years ago, has dropped to 3.75%. For 2015. So we want to make sure that you have updated your uh, payroll system before your first pay date in 2015 so that the proper percentage of Illinois state tax is being withheld. And then the employer portion of state is not withholding tax, but it is un state unemployment tax. And this is based on rates from the Illinois Department of Employment Security. Uh, this every organization is subject to state unemployment insurance. Uh, there are some types of organizations, though, that can make an option, such as governmental entities. They can make an option to go on a pay-as-you-go basis for unemployment. And what that means, if you are a government and you're interested in learning more about this, we, we can definitely talk further. But what this means is that rather than pay the percentage that the Illinois Department of Employment Security has notified you that you need to pay as an organization, that you can opt to pay as you go as unemployment claims come in. So if you do not opt to pay as you go, as an employer, you are paying a certain percentage of your employees' wages. Uh, and if you have never had any unemployment claims and you don't anticipate you will in the future, there is a possibility that the pay as you go option may be better for you because if you don't do the pay as you go, you are at least going to pay at the minimum percentage that they have that is applicable for that year. Um, the IDES should have already sent out to all the organizations what that percentage is for your organization for this year, so you want to make sure that that has been updated in your payroll system for 2015. Uh, the frequency to remit payroll, payroll taxes. Uh, those deadlines are established by looking at your payroll tax liability during the last look back period, which in this case was July 12 to June of 13. Um, Notice is to, I know this slide is has a little is a little bit old as far as the date, but in the last couple of months, uh, anyone who is subject to make a change in how often they submit the payroll taxes to the government, you should have received a uh, uh, you would have received a notice, uh, which would be effective January first of fifteen. So be on the lookout for that. If anything changed in the status of your organization that would allow that would require you to submit more frequently. Uh, you, would, you would probably see that it's being required to submit more frequently versus less frequently. Just be on the lookout if any notices do come in from the IRS or from the state and how often you do need to submit that. 
Uh, some of the information here we've already discussed. We talked about how the W-4 um, should be completed by the employee, of course, uh, at the point where they become an employee. Um, they can change it at any point in time. Um, there are rules if the uh, there are rules if the employee did not submit the form uh, on what the employer is required to take. I believe I believe it is single zero if the employee does not submit that information. Um, but it, it's best to talk to the employee and have them submit the form, and they can change it at any point in time. The only one we do encourage you to put a notice out to your employees, um, explaining to them what the form is and why it's beneficial for them to take a look at their tax status, uh, if they had any changes, marriage, children, um, et cetera, any changes in their status that would require them to have an additional amount withheld or less withheld so they don't receive a large refund at the end of the year. Um, there is no requirement that you notify them or remind them, but it's just, um, just a nice bonus to the employees to be reminded of that. The only time that the employer is required to have, a new, have the employee submit a new W-4 is if the employee has opted to claim exempt. Um, I believe the reason why is because if they are claiming an exempt, that means the federal government is not receiving their money as quickly as they would if, they, if the employee is paying in at the end of the year. So this is a way to make sure that everything is on the up and up with the employee, and this way the government can get their money sooner if they need to um, have money withheld and not be exempt in the future. Uh, we also encourage you to take a look at the compliance, annual compliance to help the, uh, the employer with capturing changes in filing status, as we mentioned, uh, exemption and withholding allowances, um, and looking at any employment taxes that may affect your employees and notifying them if you feel that it would be uh, a valid to notify them. Uh, I know that you know it's nice now that the state went down to 3.75, and a couple years ago when the Social Security dropped to 4.2, uh, it's nice now because it's good news to tell the employees so that they know they're going to receive more money in their check, or maybe they won't even notice. Um, but definitely in the case where taxes are going up, and and not at the not at the doing of the employer as much as the employer abiding by by their requirements. But in the case when state taxes went up or when the Social Security went back up to 6.2, I know that some clients opted to notify the employees of this, so they were not surprised when their check uh, was less because the percentages were going up. So it's just something to consider, no requirements there, as much as just something to consider. All right, so then our next area uh, is the taxability of fringe benefits. We're going to just kind of cover a couple of common questions. Uh, common questions that have come in mostly from governmental entities. So most of these examples will we'll, we'll cover all employers, but I know our specific examples here are related to uh, governmental entities. I know we have several on the line. Uh, the first is gift cards. I know this applies to everybody. Um, often employers will um, opt to just hand a $50 gift card to an employee who worked on a project and um, did a great job as a way to compensate them somewhat offline and not through the payroll system. Well, the IRS actually considers a gift card to be convertible to cash value, and as a result, it would be taxable compensation. Um, some people may say that it's, a, it's de minimis. It's, it's minimal, and uh, it's not it's $50 or less, or whatever you may think is de minimis. Um, the IRS actually says that anything that is cash or can be converted to cash, there is no de minimis number. There is no dollar amount. If it can be, if this cash or can be converted, so it's it's very important that these be run through um, the payroll system, or if you're handing them a gift card, that you go back and you enter it into your payroll system so that they're properly taxed on this compensation that they're receiving from the employer. The next area, obviously, is very specific to government, the benefits to aldermen and trustees as elected officials. Um, as elected officials, they are considered employees if they are receiving compensation. Um, you need to issue a W-2. It should not go through the AP system if they're, uh, they receive you know, $100 to uh, go to every board meeting. Um, that should not be coming, going out to them in the form of an AP check, but rather through the payroll system and tax. 
Um, they also need to take a look at what the fringe benefits are they are receiving as a result of being an elected official, and those should be included on the W-2. Um, so um, in some cases, the W-2 um, may only include the fringe benefits that they need to be taxed on if there is no compensation for attending meetings or um, so on. So an example would be if they have a car, they are being reimbursed for internet usage, or they have an iPad or a computer is being provided to them. We need to make sure that any fringe benefits, as well as cash, cash uh, compensation, is being properly reported for um, aldermen or trustees or elected officials. The next couple of slides we're going to cover are employer-provided vehicles. Um, lots of information on these couple of slides here. Uh, again, this can cover most employees. There are specific examples here. Uh, are relate, relate to governmental uh, entities, but, but any company can provide a car to an employee. Um, personal use is taxable unless it's get, daily commuting is, not, to, is um, not considered minimal. So what this means is if they are using the car, if the, um, for example, the police chief is provided with a car and it is clearly a marked vehicle, which as a couple slides from now we're going to see what is defined as a, a vehicle. Um, they, they can use that, but the personal use will be, um, will be taxable to them. So uh, we need to take a look at which employees, which in most cases is department heads, are using employer-provided vehicles and what the personal use versus business use is. So this is uh, what to, this this slide here defines what an who an employee is, um, and it, it would be someone who's on call at all times, required to use the vehicle for commuting, and must pro prohibit personal use outside of the jurisdiction. And then we have the um, this is, is defining the vehicle and the fact that it's owned or leased by the governmental unit. And that is clearly marked with its is, is with insignia, or words that it is a public safety officer vehicle. So whether it be a fire truck or a um, SUV that many fire chiefs will drive, as long as it indicates what fire department they're from, that would be considered an employer-provided vehicle. And this is more information on that, also. And then we have employee cell phones. Um, this. Uh, and uh, recently, I own, several years ago, actually about 10 years ago, uh, I had a client who provided cell phones, employer provided cell phones to department heads, um, and then every month they would go, the employee would go through and indicate which were personal calls and which were not. Um, the IRS recently acknowledged that that took a lot of time to go through those records and determine what was taxable and what was not. And so recently they announced that cell phones uh, provided will not be taxable and detailed records no longer need to be maintained. Uh, for the cell phone needs to be provided for business reasons. Uh, this means they need to be able to contact the employee at all times uh, or be, the employee needs to be available to speak to clients outside of the normal work day. Uh, uniforms and work clothes. Um, this should be under an accountable plan. The clothing must be worn as a condition of employment and not suitable for everyday wear. So many people have different examples of or um, definitions of what this means. Uh, so an example would be a delivery worker, a firefighter's uniform, etc. Um, those specific types of uniforms and work clothes that cannot be used outside or is not normally used outside of the, of the employee's workday would be considered um, non-taxable. It's part of it's a condition of employment. Um, condition clothing worn by plain clothes officers would not be deductible, even if it's provided to them as a result of a union negotiated contract. So what this means is that um, often the police department will reimburse uh, detectives or certain people in certain positions um, or provide them with a stipend. That is an often common uh, occurrence in that the, every, every quarter a list of people receive a stipend through accounts payable for $500 for uh, work clothes. Um, 
in most cases, those detectives will use that $500 to head out and purchase uh, khakis and other clothing items that they could wear out on a Saturday or Sunday afternoon. And unless it is specific to that fire department or police department, we want to make sure that they are being taxed on those stipends. Um, this has been discussed by the IRS for several years now, and they are cracking down. Um, in the last six months, we did have a client who had an IRS audit, and um, they actually received, uh, they actually owed the IRS several, um, a lot of money related to another issue, which we're going to get to in a couple minutes. But I will tell you that they also um, had to pay in for this specific situation. So we want to make sure that if you are uh, providing stipends to employees for uniforms and they don't meet the criteria of, um, of, of being non-taxable, we want to make sure that that is running through payroll and it is being taxed. It is considered an employee benefit. Next area is group term life insurance. This has been around for a, uh, a while. Uh, the, you can exclude up to $50,000 of group term life insurance. Um, often that $50,000 number has been around for a while. Um, when it came out, there were, there were probably few that even hit that. Um, now it's very common that employees will come on board and the, the employer will indicate that they'll provide life insurance up to one year of the salary. And uh, it doesn't take much for someone to be over 50000 on a starting salary now. So uh, the employer needs to make sure that if that is the rule, that they are taxing for any amount above the $50,000. Um, the IRS has a table of, the, of how to calculate how much is included in wages. It's not, uh, say your salary is $60,000, you are not going to get taxed on that $10,000. There's a table where you take that excess over the $50,000 and you plug it into the table. And it's possible that maybe your tax, the additional tax, the wages, or that benefit, is only $1,000. So you need to plug that information in. It's also based on age of the employee. So if you have that situation, be sure that you are taxing them. And the information is in the IRS Publication 15-B. Uh, that would, if, if you determine that an employee is um, receiving this benefit, you need to make sure that it's not subject to income tax withholding, but it is subject to FICA and Medicare tax. Um, we have several employees with this, of many employees that this applies to. Um, you have several options. You can opt to tax this throughout the year. You can determine at the beginning of the year and then put a, uh, an amount on each paycheck so it is taxed. Uh, we also have where an employer will determine at the end of the year and put it on their last paycheck of the year. Our next slide is our first um, code for CPE. So if you could um, take, make note that the code is income, that would be great. And then when the survey comes out at the end, as long as you um, indicate that on the survey, then you'll be eligible for CPE credit. Okay, so our next session is preparing for year-end payroll. Very similar to some of the items we already talked about. Uh, in order to, and I understand that it's already January 8th and, and you've um, you probably already processed the last payroll of 2014, but just definitely some things to keep in mind uh, as you are wrapping up 14 and going into 15, and even for next year when you um, are wrapping up 15 and maybe you wanted to make some changes in your procedures. Um, the first one we covered is uh, verifying employee information. So as you're wrapping up 2014 and you start looking at uh, issuing your W-2s, you want to make sure that your employee names and social security numbers match with so the social security cards. Again, you don't want any W-2s to come back and um, cause additional research and refiling. The so phone extra employees I addresses are current and up to date. Depending on the size of your organization, it's pretty common that um, employees will uh, notify you or you'll hear through the grapevine that they've moved. So we want to make sure that all that information is up to date or their W-2 may be delayed in um, being sent out to them. And then you'll be fielding phone calls um, come the end of January, begin of February, asking where the W-2 was mailed to. Um, depending on how you currently do your payroll process, most of you are probably mailing um, direct deposit advices because most people are depositing their paychecks directly. Um, but not everybody is receiving. I can tell you that um, you know, often people will walk around and hand their direct deposit advices out to their employees or leave them on their desk. So they're not always being mailed. So it's possible that someone moved and you just haven't been notified yet. So you want to take every step you can to make sure that that information is up to date. Um, some of this 
we talked about related to W-2 preparation. We have different use of the company vehicle. You want to make sure that if it is a taxable fringe benefit that you are uh, including that information. Um, there are a couple of different ways of how you can um, IRS uh, regulations about how to calculate that taxable fringe benefit. I think the first question to ask is, are any employees being provided with a company vehicle on a, on a regular basis? Um, and then the other highlight on this slide is that the personal, uh, the per mile reimbursement has changed for 2015. It is now, it went up from 56 cents in 2014 to 57.5. Um, this would affect not only from a payroll perspective and what the personal miles would be if a company vehicle is, um, is being used, but it also affects if you are reimbursing employees for travel um, for, from an AP perspective. So if uh, an employee traveled to a seminar or conference and they submit a, um, a an expense report, you want to make sure that that has been updated to 57.5 cents for 2015. Uh, medical insurance premiums for S Corp shareholders, you want to make sure that those amounts are added to gross wages on the W-2. We talked about the group term life insurance. We'll make sure anything over 50000 of coverage is taxable to the employee and included on the W-2. Uh, annual bonuses, uh, anything, uh, any bonuses must have a 1231 check date to count as a bonus for what would be 2014. Otherwise, it will be considered next year income um, and expense to the employer if it is paid out in 2015. Uh, early re retirement incentives, this is the other area that our client was least recently um, owed money to the IRS related to this um, topic, early retirement incentives. If an employee is offered health insurance options with a cash alternative, the health insurance benefit becomes taxable to the employee. So what this means is if I am ready to retire, and I don't, need ins I don't need to take the health insurance option that's being offered to me as a retiree through the employer um, because my husband has coverage and I do not want to take that option. Um, that is fine. I can opt for that. If the employer is offering, instead of me taking the health insurance, instead offering to pay me $10,000, for example, if that cash alternative is available and there, um, obviously if I took the 10000 it would be taxable. But the other piece is that the health insurance benefit, if I opt for that because my husband does not have coverage, that also becomes taxable to the employee. So we want to make sure that that is, um, if that option is out there as a cash alternative um, to anyone who is looking to retire, we want to make sure that that is investigated and properly handled. Um, and the next item is the clothing purchases for employees. We covered on that. Uh, it is taxable if it is suitable for everyday wear. Uh, 401k contributions. Uh, the contribution limits came out. Um, I have them up there on the slide. Um, and I know there are other several other um, contribution limits that change every year, 457 contributions and so on. Uh, I do not have those on the slides. If you're in, in, interested in information about limits uh, as they change each year for different contributions to pension plans and so on, definitely uh, let us know. We can provide you with that information. Uh, then the last piece on this slide is if they are, if an employee is receiving a bonus, again, I do apologize that this, this is more applicable if this was a month ago, but if they are receiving a bonus, want to make sure you communicate with the um, employee to see if they want to change the amount of their withholdings. If, um, if they're in a great position and they're going to receive a $50,000 bonus and their check is usually much less than that, we want to make sure that they are taking a look at what their withholdings are as well as any contributions to the 401k plan because most of those calculations are based on gross pay and if you're going to pay out a bonus, those other calculations are going to be affected. So you want to make sure you communicate with your employees. And bonuses usually come out at year end and that's why it's under the preparing for year end payroll slide uh, because it would affect that information. Uh, the W-2 reporting of health coverage. If an employer files less than 250 forms, W-2 forms, in 2013, you're exempt from reporting health coverage for 2014. If you had more than 250, then it must be included uh, on your W-2 for 2014. Um, this is reported in box 12 using the, the code DD, and it is employee and employer costs um, are included 
and it is health only. It does not include dental or life coverage. Uh, we do have um, some clients who have less than 250. They're not required to put this information on there, but they are opting to do so uh, in advance of the requirements. So that's something you can definitely do as an option. Uh, the other reminder then was the employer provided cell phone, which we did cover in detail. Okay. The next topic is the year-end payroll reconciliation. Um, the first section is related to reviewing bank reconciliations and looking for any uncleared paychecks. If, it's, if you determine, and I know most people are on direct deposit now, so it's really not an issue because if a direct deposit comes back as an invalid account, usually uh, correct it pretty quickly. Um, but sometimes there are paper checks that are issued uh, to employees that have never been cashed. Um, usually this is um, determined as part of the bank rec process. Maybe you have an accountant who is separate than the payroll clerk or the person who is processing payroll, sort of make sure that they're talking to each other, uh, that on a monthly basis the accountant is notifying the payroll clerk of any uncashed checks. Now, if it's one, the 30 to 60 days out, it's not, um, maybe you don't contact the employee yet, but if it becomes more than 90 days, I would contact the employee. Um, you always have the possibility that if, it's became, if it remains uncashed uh, and not voided and reissued because the employee lost it, then it would become unclaimed property and would need to be turned over to the state after five years, which is the Illinois unclaimed property rule. Uh, as far as payroll reconciliation, we want to make sure that all the information from your quarterly 941 add up to agree to your W-2s, which also agrees to your w W-3 summary, uh, both from gross wages as well as um, all the different taxes, federal, Social Security, and Medicare. We want to make sure all that information agrees because the government will be matching it all up and you will be notified if it does not. Uh, I also highly recommend that as you wrap up the fourth quarter of the year that you don't file your fourth quarter 941 until you have your W-2s and your W-3 all ready and everything is reconciled because if you determine that there was an issue back in the first quarter of the year, you can adjust it through your fourth quarter 941. So rather than have to amend your fourth quarter, I would just hold off. Um, all of it is due, um, actually your, your fourth quarter 941 wouldn't be due until January 31st. So you have plenty of time to be able to hold off on filing that until everything reconciles. Um, and then finally, for my section before Joy join, uh, uh, joins us, I have this uh, references page, useful references, of course, the IRS website as well as some of their publications. The other, um, the other item I wanted to mention, which is not on the slide, is if you are from a uh, government, uh, if you're not already in tune with the FSLG, which is the Federal State Local Government Division of the IRS or the group of the IRS, I do encourage you to check them out on the IRS website. They have what I consider very useful uh, newsletters, which are emailed out. I want to say that they're quarterly, but I actually think they might be um, maybe every six, I, I'm not sure the consistency, but six to 12 months. Uh, they also have monthly webinars. And you can sign up for uh, to be on their distribution list for the newsletters, which will come to you automatically in an email. And then the monthly webinars, um, are, I believe, are also very useful. It's usually about one hour. And you chime in, you, you will obtain a copy of the presentation. And um, also very useful. Um, the FSLG division, once you go on to their section of the IRS website, they actually have several um, employees who cover different regions. So our region, probably Wisconsin is included, um, our, our most recent rep is Paula Graham. Um, she is very helpful, responds very quickly if you have any questions. Um, this FSLG was created a couple of years ago in an attempt to, for training and to get on the front end of making sure that governmental entities are aware of what needs to be done because they are unique in that not everything applies to them, but yet other things apply to them that don't apply to regular companies. So this group of the IRS is um, specific to governmental entities. So if you're not, if you are from a government and you are interested in becoming um, involved and receive their information, I encourage you to check that out on the IRS website. All right. So uh, Joy is now going to discuss the compliance and legal issues related to payroll. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Debbie. As Debbie had mentioned, I am Joy Deuce. I lead Sickage's Human Resources Consulting Practice. 
I am located out of our Milwaukee office. So hopefully those of you in different warmer locations, it's zero degrees, negative 20 it feels like, and it's aggressively snowing. So hopefully wherever you're sitting, you're enjoying some better weather. We are going to be sending out the presentation to you if you participated after today's webinar. So there will be some links in here that I will reference throughout my portion of the presentation where we're able to provide those to you later on. So I'm going to start out by talking about the latest trends in wages, wage and hour compliance. We're seeing greater cooperation between the government agencies. So the EEOC, which is the Equal Opportunity Employment Commission, Department of Labor, ICE, which is the U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, IRS and other state agencies have gotten together and said, hey, we should really information share. If you have a claim and you're investigating it, maybe you should refer that to us. So they're doing this out of a number of reasons. Number one, there's a greater need for them to bring in revenue. They have had an influx of hiring of additional staff and auditors, so they'd like to keep those individuals busy. And there's also been an influx of claims. There's quite a bit of opportunity for the end user or the employee to file wage and hour claim much more easily than it used to be. You can simply go to one of these websites and click and submit your claim in less than 10 minutes without leaving the comfort of your own phone, using your cell phone. They're now starting to come out with apps that you could simply click. So it's a lot less onus on the employee to file a wage and hour complaint, and thus the agencies are information sharing and bulking up their resources. One of the largest focal points that the Department of Labor has been looking at relates to independent contractors. They have found, and I have found through my client base, that there's a number of individuals who are often improperly classified as independent contractors. So the Department of Labor is no longer looking at just strengthening its own enforcement on a federal level. It's also strengthening the ability for states to enforce misclassification of independent contra contractors as well. So what this means is that there will be more audits of employer relationships within the state. The Department of Labor is providing $10.2 million in funding to 19 different states to enhance the misclassification audit program and other initiatives that are aimed at cutting down on misclassifying independent contractors. The grants are made possible through what was called the Consolidated Appropriations Act of 2014. Generally, the federal government does not like to give this kind of money away unless they feel it's going to produce a significant investment. So the states are going to use this to investigate inappropriate relationships that are classified wrongly for independent contractors. States that will benefit from this additional funding are listed on this next slide here. Employers that reside in Maryland, New Jersey, Texas, and Utah will want to tread extra carefully. The Department of Labor is granting them what they're calling high performance bonuses due to their high performance or most improved performance in detecting workforce misclassification. So basically what that means is the Department of Labor says, hey, individuals who work for us in Maryland, New Jersey, Texas, and Utah, you guys had great performance. You've recovered the most fines and fees. You've uncovered the most independent contractors that are wrongly classified. We're going to give you a little bit extra money. So those four states will split an additional $2 million in bonus money. And then remaining states will get $8.2 million to split amongst themselves. You will see that some states are not on here. That does not mean that you're immune to it, but you will see greater enforcement in the states that are listed on this slide. Another classification change that had come out, um, it was expected to come down in November of 2014, but the final rules now are not expected to come out until spring of 2015, was the Department of Labor was amending their white collar exemption. So in early March of 2014, President Barack Obama signed a presidential memorandum which was directing his Secretary of Labor 
to update the regulations that expand the number of employees eligible for overtime under the Fair Labor Standards Act. In May of 2014, the Obama administration then released its regulatory agenda, indicating that the U.S. Department of Labor was scheduled to release its white-collar overtime exemption regulations in November of 2014. We are anticipating that these new regulations will be significantly more narrow than the current regulations with regard to the duties that will ultimately qualify for exempt status and salary level. No final rulings have been brought through yet, but we're expecting probably spring of 2015 that the new regulations will come through because once they're proposed, they have a 30-day comment period and that can be extended up to 60 days. So this is something that you will want to keep on your radar. What can you do in the meantime? We encourage you to be proactive and prepare for these new regulations. You can do that by reviewing your current classification of employees as exempt or non-exempt under the current Fair Labor Standards regulations or state laws that have jurisdiction in your area. You can also review your pay policies and work rules to ensure that current compliance and identity by any needs that may need to be updated. And you can also ensure that processes are in place to track hours worked. And we'll talk a little bit more about some of those things, but being proactive in this white collar exemption is definitely a good idea. The Department of Labor is also proposing new rules to collect compensation data from federal contractors. So if you are a federal contractor, this is something that you will want to keep your pulse on. On August 6th of 2014, the Department of Labor announced a proposed rule that would require federal contractors and subcontractors annually to submit equal pay reports on employee compensation to the OFCCP. And again, the OFCCP is the Office of Federal Contract Compliance Program. Really what they're aiming to do with this proposed rule is to collect summary data on how federal contractors and subcontractors are paying their employees with an eye towards identifying gender-based and race-based pay discrepancies. So this is a significant change, and the proposed rule would require contractors to provide compensation information for their workforce broken down by sex, race, ethnicity, and other specified job categories. So this is something else that we will want to keep a pulse on in anticipation if this would affect your business of this proposed rule being finalized in 2015. Employers should consider reviewing and revising their current comp systems and practices with the assistance of a solid HR professional or legal counsel to make sure you're proactively identifying any compensation issues that reflect certain categories or classes of employees negatively. Wage and hour audits are on the rise. Um, there was recently an employer survey that was completed that said that 54% of employers intend to conduct their own internal audits of their wage and hour practices or utilize a qualified HR consultant or legal representative to do so. More than half say that they're man monitoring trends and exempt misclassification litigation to ensure that they don't become a victim of this. And as we talked about with the great collaboration between all the different government agencies, chances are if you get hit with one type of audit, a different federal agency will also be coming in to examine your records, your policies, and your practices. The big two that are on the horizon, and we briefly talked about independent contractors already, the big two misclassifications that the government is putting their money behind is independent contractors and looking at misclassifications that talk about exempt versus non-exempt employees. And so I'm going to go into that a little bit at this point. Looking at independent contractors, we have already somewhat touched on this, but this has been a phenomenal revenue source for the government. I oftentimes will have contact clients call me and they will say, 
well, I'm going to hire so-and-so, but just for the ease of everything and they don't need benefits and I can pay them a little more because they won't have benefits, I'm going to make them an independent contractor. And that always throws up a big red flag because there are tests available for independent contractor status. So you really need to examine who are your independent contractors. There's three tests that you can utilize. There's the behavioral control, financial control, and type of relationship. And each of these tests helps to determine the actual independence of a contractor. If an independent contractor requires substantial instruction or training from you as the employer before beginning work, he or she is probably not an independent contractor. An independent contractor is expected to come in and have the expertise, the education, the training to step right into the position. An independent contractor should have his or her own tools or equipment. The organization does not reimburse business expenses, such as mileage or printing, for an independent contractor. Oftentimes, an independent contractor will have other clients who are paying him and her for similar work, so they're not just exclusively working with you. They have a book of business that they're providing services to various employers. The independent contractor bills the clients, and it is not paid through payroll. So it's a billing type relationship versus this individual actually being on your payroll. And the independent contractor is often responsible for his or her own business and the profit and losses that come with that business. So if you have an individual you're classifying as an independent contractor, and they're on your payroll, and you're providing them training, you're providing them a cell phone, a laptop, a desktop, that is most likely not an independent contractor relationship. I would recommend if you have an independent contractor and you're comfortable that you have appropriately classified that person, they will typically have a written contract with the organization that does not draw any benefits, including health insurance, paid time off, et cetera. The relationship oftentimes is not permanent, and it can be ended at any time by either the independent contractor or the employer. They're not necessarily a key part of the business. They're really providing a service, not a standing ongoing function. There's many tests that you can do to ultimately determine this. But the safest route is to work with an HR consultant or an attorney to make sure that you're properly classifying individuals you feel should be independent contractors. Let's say you have someone who's classified as an independent contractor and you run into some type of claim. Some of the questions that the court may ask about an independent contractor are listed up here. And again, independent contractors can make decisions about how their work is done. They're not required to abide by organizational policies and procedures. They don't get an employee handbook. They're not employed, invited to the employee-only company party. They oftentimes have their own employees working for them, and they have decisions whether or not they can hire or fire employees to work in their business. They often work off-site, or they make their own schedule if they're working within your four walls. They have their own tools and equipment, and they're often engaged by multiple employers, as I had said. So keep those things in mind that determine an independent contractor, and also keep these questions on the screen, because these are the questions if you receive an audit or a complaint that they're going to come with you um, and ask. Looking at employer misclassification, let's say that you ultimately have misclassified somebody. You could be liable for payment of back taxes, unpaid Social Security or Medicare contributions, unemployment insurance, unpaid work comp, and also penalties and interest. And let's say there is one independent contractor who files a complaint or something happens. You will not only be liable for that person, they're going to look through and see all the other individuals that have been potentially misclassified, and you will be liable for those as well. This is a very lucrative source of revenue for the government. And there's really four common ways that the government is notified that an independent contractor has been ultimately misclassified. Number one would be they get hurt on the job. So guess what? These people are not considered employees. 
So your work comp policy does not cover them, which means if they are injured at your place of employment and you have misclassified them, they can sue you directly for negligence, expanding their recovery of potential damages. Another big red flag to the government is if an individual goes and files for unemployment. The authorities often try to attack their independent contractor relationship with multiple people. So if you've misclassified them and they file for unemployment, that's often a red flag to the government to take a look at how you're classifying people. If an individual did not pay self-employment taxes, so when the IRS comes knocking on a quote-unquote independent contractor's door and asks them about their tax payments and the work they did, they tend to conclude that they were an employee and you should have been withholding the 14% annually. If they cannot collect this, they being the government, from the independent contractor, they will attempt to collect it from you, the employer, not to mention any additional fines and penalties. Some states, such as California, for example, have even kicked this up a notch, and they're making this a criminal offense if you engage in misclassification. The last big flag that the government triggers them to feel you've misclassified somebody is if the National Labor Relations Board is getting a little bit too interested. And again, we talked about that conjunction of agencies working together. Independent contractors do not have the ability to organize in the workplace. Only employees do. So this means that the National Labor Relations Board, which is very pro-union, doesn't like when you classify folks as independent contractors. So kind of keep those four things in mind. If you do currently have independent contractor relationships, I suggest that you reevaluate them and make certain that the individual is properly classified, and if not, you make all means to rectify that immediately. The second opportunity for the government to come in, audit your workforce, and institute fines and fees for misclassification is exempt versus non-exempt employees. And this is such a challenging thing for so many employers to get their head around because people say, well, I pay them a salary, they're exempt, or they supervise one person, they're exempt. And that's not always necessarily true. Anytime you pay someone hourly, they are considered non-exempt and eligible for overtime. So we have some that say, oh, this person's salary, but we pay them hourly they're technically non-exempt. Anytime you ask someone to track hours, you're running the risk that the position they're in could be determined as non-exempt. It is okay to ask your exempt employees to track things like vacation, sick, paid time off, or in a situation like a public accounting firm, a law firm, where you're in the billing process and those billings are based on hours, but other than that, if I am an exempt employee, my supervisor should not be requiring me to log my hours, to come in and punch a clock, or submit hours for payroll. An individual's responsibilities are really what determine his or her status as either exempt or non-exempt. We're going to take a look at this more in depth, but basically we're looking at the level of autonomy, the impact they have on decisions, their creativity, their independence, their budgetary and supervisory control. So it's not necessarily what you say the person does, what their job description says they do, it's actually what they do. And the greater level of freedom and autonomy an individual has in a position, the more likely that position is to be exempt from overtime. Again, as I previously mentioned, I want to hit on this. Just because somebody has the title of manager, such as office manager, does not necessarily make them exempt. So all exempt positions are paid on a salaried basis, but not all salaried positions are considered exempt from overtime. So please do not fully look at the title they hold. You could say somebody is a director, but if they do not have autonomy, impact in decisions, creativity, 
so on and so forth, they are not exempt under the law. If you find yourself in a situation where you are defending your exempt misclassification, you could lose or settle exemption cases because the position was misclassified. But you can provide sufficient evidence as to why you ultimately went through the steps and thought that this position was exempt. You can take a look at business records, duties that a person has done. Performance appraisals are a great tool to defend this. When an employee is completing a self-appraisal and they're providing evidence in a written affidavit of their job responsibilities and their own words, that is a great tool to impeach any type of data they may give in a wage and hour claim. So doing things like self-appraisals, performance appraisals, having solid job descriptions in place that ultimately are there and they're updated and they're relevant and the employee has signed off on it and agrees that this is what they are actually doing are ways that you can easily defend um, exempt misclassification. As Debbie had previously mentioned, if you're requesting CPE credit, on your survey, you will be asked to provide three keywords. So our second keyword is exempt. Moving on, I'd like to talk about improper deductions from pay. The Fair Labor Standards Act has a safe harbor aspect to it. So if an employer has a clearly communicated policy prohibiting improper deductions, they also include a complaint mechanism in it. And if an improper deduction is made, it is reimbursed immediately, and there's a good faith commitment to comply in the future, the employee will not lose their exemption for any employees unless you're willfully violating the policy by continuing improper deductions after receiving an employee complaint. So kind of to reiterate on that, if you have made some improper deductions, the employees bring it to your attention, you realize it, you rectify it immediately, you have policies that prohibit that type of behavior, you do have a safe harbor there. If complaints are brought to your attention, you do not investigate them, you do not rectify things that you have found, or perhaps an employee, somebody in your accounting department has brought to your attention and you simply sweep it under the rug, then you would definitely be in a position of being vulnerable for litigation, fines, and fees. I'd like to talk a little bit next about docking exempt pay. This is often a very confusing aspect for employers. And don't feel bad if you have trouble understanding the pay docking rules laid out by the Fair Labor Standards Act, because they are very murky and they're very hard to interpret. Really, as a rule of thumb, the Fair Labor Standards Act does not permit deductions from exempt employees. The regs state that the amount of money a salaried employee earns cannot be dependent upon the number of hours he or she works. You also cannot, as an employer, deduct money based on the quantity or quality of work that an employee is actually producing for you. Now, here comes that magic word, but. No surprises here, there are several exemptions. So what happens, again, if your employee makes an improper deduction? Nothing, as long as it's an isolated incident and the company corrects it. Where you're gonna get into trouble is if you have repeat violations or you have entire departments or areas of exempt workers that can suddenly be transferred to overtime eligible ones by the magical power of the Fair Labor Standards Act. So on the screen, I have listed some prohibited, uh, permitted, excuse me, deductions. I'm going to kind of go through those. And if you have any specific questions about a circumstance in your work, place of work, I'm happy to address that with you. Exempt employees do not need to be paid for any work week in which they perform no work. So I have performed absolutely no work in the work week. There is no need to pay me. 
exempt employees who are absent for one day or more for personal reasons other than sickness or accident. So note, these deductions must be made only in full day increments, not partial day increments. The biggest rule of thumb with an exempt employee is if you're taking deductions, it has to be in a full day increment, never a partial day increment. Exempt employee absences of a day or more caused by a potential sickness or disability, if the company maintains a plan that provides compensation for loss of salary for sickness or disability, and the employee has exhausted that bank. So for example, you, you provide an employee three weeks of paid time off. It's November 15th, they've exhausted all that paid time off, and they fall ill with the flu, and they're out an entire day on Friday. Because you have offered a bank of time, they've exhausted that, you're perfectly OK to take a full day deduction from them. What you cannot do is, I am an exempt employee. I come in. I am feeling ill, and I leave at noon to go home. You cannot deduct me a partial day absence. It has to be in full day increments. You can also deduct exempt pay if there's a violation of a safety rule of major significance. And you can find what major significance is on the OSHA website. You can do it to offset any amounts received by an employee as a jury or a witness or a witness fee, military pay. However, beyond those offset, deductions may not be made for absences caused by employee jury duty, attendance to be a witness, or temporary military leave. You can institute unpaid disciplinary suspension of one or more full day for breaking a work rule. And you can also deduct for partial weeks work during the initial or final weeks of employment. So for example, if Joe resigns in the middle of the work week, you can only pay him for the days he actually worked that week. Again, if you have any specific circumstances that you would like to discuss, I'm happy to do so. Um, other wage and hour issues, just to kind of wrap up, that you want to be aware of, and a lot of these apply to your specific state regulations, looking at training time, travel time, on-call time, clocking in and clocking out, automatic deductions for meal periods is oftentimes a big no-no um, if individuals are not taking that break for meal period, but you're still deducting for it. Uh, given the fact that we're all connected through personal devices, cell phones, iPads, laptops, how are you handling that use of devices during non-working hours? So these are all things that you want to keep on your radar Make sure you have solid policies and programs, and it's understood. As I reference, having solid knowledge of your state laws related to payroll is very important. And here are some other things that you want to keep on your radar. A lot of these are dictated by your specific state laws. And I know we have individuals in various states today. These are things that you want to take a look at. Make sure you have solid policies that are legally compliant that they're explained and understood by the employee, and that they're executed equally among all employees. And the majority of these can easily be housed in a handbook type environment. I wanted to touch on records retention briefly. Each employer shall preserve for at least three years payroll records, collective bargaining agreements, sales and purchase records. Looking at uh, wage computation records, those should be retained for at least two years. I would recommend, if you are audited, that you put the specific auditor in a conference room and bring the records to him or her. Because if you have your payroll records, you have your wage records, you have your I-9 records, you have everything in one filing cabinet, that gives that individual free reign to look through all those in an audit environment. So really segregating that person out and only giving them specifically what they ask for is very important. Again, fair pay practices are very important given the increased scrutiny under the laws. And the laws that are really going to apply to that are the Equal Pay Act of 1963. This is a federal law which actually amended the Fair Labor Standards 
Standards Act, and it's aimed at abolishing wage disparity among sexes. I don't know if any of you have heard of the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act. These next couple are more recent acts that have been put into, um, into the works. This went into effect in 2009, and it's a federal statute in the United States. And it was actually the first bill that President Barack Obama signed into law um, in January of 2009. It amended the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And the new act does put a 180-day statute of limitation for filing an equal pay lawsuit regarding pay discrimination that resides with uh, pay disparities. Uh, Paycheck Fairness Act, that also amended a portion of the Fair Labor Standards Act known as the Equal Pay. Um, and this remedies, enforces, and it also provides exceptions against sexual discrimination in the way that you pay wages. So again, the best way to do this is to create a positive environment, allow employees to come to you with concerns, have solid policies and practices in effect, and ultimately be able to rectify any issues by investigating them and making any means of correcting them immediately. So again, how do we ensure paying fairly, solid job descriptions, solid salary structure, a solid compensation philosophy? And these are so incredibly key um, for each organization to have. And if you don't and you would like assistance in um, preparing those, please feel free to reach out to me. For the balance of my presentation, I am going to talk a little bit about health care reform and how that impacts payroll. So at this point, if you haven't fallen asleep yet, uh, you probably want to bury your head in the sand, as many of us do. What do we know today? Health care reform is here to stay. It is very, very confusing. Guidance continually is being issued, but there's so many unknowns. But one thing we do know is that the administrative burden in 2015 and 2016 is going to be very significant. And if you are not in a position to handle that appropriately, it is going to be very, very difficult on you and your organization. This next chart really shows how payroll, HR, benefits all somewhat meld together with health care reform. My best advice to you is be proactive. Partner with a solid insurance broker, a solid attorney, a solid tax advisor, a solid HR consultant to really help you through this. Take on what you can internally, outsource what you don't have the expertise to do internally. Looking at the payroll perspective, and what you're looking at as far as some of the record keeping requirements, the hours tracking requirements, it's a great opportunity to assess your current payroll system if you have one in place. But it's also a good opportunity to assess if you don't have a budget for a payroll system, or you do and you're looking to find out what system you want to implement. Start thinking about how you're going to deal with this administrative burden of tracking and reporting hours. If you're looking at a system, you're looking at how you're going to do it through Excel, you're looking at your current system, some of the questions you want to be asking yourself or asking that potential provider is how is my system going to handle tracking the hire dates, tracking multiple hire dates, rehires, leave of absence, documenting employment status, reporting on hours work, so the full-time equivalent, managing the hours that are worked tracking the measurement periods, the stability periods, and tracking auto-enrollment. It's very important that if you're going to invest in a system, you're going to look at your system, that you have the ability to make sure you're making the best decisions and allocating those budget dollars appropriately. Looking at some of the administrative concerns, 2015 was really a year, and this will be a year, where employer mandate and new reporting requirements are coming. So there's a number of things that individuals are going to have to be responsible for. And we're going to take a look at some of those in our upcoming slides. Prior to that, our next CPE code word is measurement. 
so please make a note of that. And we will talk just a little bit about reporting requirements. So looking at some of the IRS releases, the draft reporting, it's really important to understand that it's very difficult for one person to be an expert when it comes to the Affordable Care Act. You need a solid broker, an HR professional, a tax professional, an attorney to really help you go through this difficult time. So employers that have 100 or more full-time equivalent employees as of 2015 through the employer mandate needed to offer dependent coverage or you were subject to a fine under the employer shared responsibilities provision. So to comply with the employer shared responsibility requirements or you were have to calculate your penalties for non-compliance, you really needed to identify who truly are your full-time employees. So by doing that, you're classifying all employees as full-time, part-time, seasonal, or some other type of variable. With this, you want to look at updating your handbook, your payroll system, and other documents to accurately reflect these classifications. You want to determine classification status by using a monthly measurement period or a look-back measurement period. An employer penalty may apply if at least one full-time employee receives a subsidy from the marketplace because the employer did not offer a plan meeting the minimal essential coverage or the employer offered coverage that did not meet the minimum value or affordability requirements. So it can be as little as one employee who is misclassified and did not receive the proper subsidy or was not offered coverage that you can receive a penalty for. Looking at some of the uh, background on reporting and when reporting is due, new reporting responsibilities are beginning with employers with 100 or more full-time equivalent employees. Now, employers that have 50 to 99 employees are receiving a one-year delay if you certify with the IRS that you have met special provisions. So data collection begins in January of 2015 to be reported as early as 2016. That's why it's so important to really begin assessing where you are at with your system and how you're going to begin tracking this. Because while you don't have to report till 2016, data collection is beginning in 2015. So section 6055 of the reporting requires insurers and self-insured employers to submit information on each covered person. And this information is ultimately used to enforce the individual mandate. Section 6056 reporting assists in the enforcement of the ERS, which is the Employer Shared Responsibility Mandate, and tracking of individual eligibility for premium tax credit. So it's very important that you're looking at these two IRS sections, that you're partnered with a strong individual who can ultimately assist you. Looking at when reporting is ultimately due, um, I have some dates on here as to when it's required um, as far as the IRS filing, the due dates, and like I said, while you're seeing 2016, the reporting and the tracking ultimately begins in 2015, so it's very important that we're taking a look at that. The IRS has issued a number of drafts of the reporting forms. These are, again, drafts. Um, more guidance is expected in September, which is great timing since we're all supposed to comply with this. But I will be sending out the slide deck to you. You are able to look at these forms, see what's expected of you, see what ultimately you as an employer have to ultimately um, put forth. So to kind of wrap up your focus in 2015 to make sure that you are ultimately on the right page from a payroll and HR stance is updating those job descriptions, taking a look at that exempt, non-exempt status, documenting how you're classifying these individuals, reviewing any independent contractor relationships, making sure there's agreements in place, making sure that you're addressing wage and hour issues in your policies, educating your supervisors as they're often the frontline individuals dealing with that, 
making sure you're keeping accurate payroll records, and looking at health care reform and starting to work towards that. At this time, we are going to open it up for questions. I'm going to have Debbie take some of the initial questions. If we are unable to get to your question, we will definitely circle back with you and make sure that we are able to answer that uh, after the presentation. Debbie? Great. Thank you, Joy. Okay, so we did have a couple of questions come in that I can share um, the answers to um, now with the group. Uh, the first one is it, the question came in asking if the PowerPoint would be um, sent out. And yes, after the presentation, we will be sending the, the presentation out. Uh, so if you have any questions once you review the PowerPoint again, uh, feel free to contact us. Uh, the next question that came in um, actually requires a little bit of clarification on my part uh, on our slide regarding uh, unclaimed property. I had indicated it was uh, five years for unclaimed property. Um, that actually is for all entities except the government. So thank you for your question. It is still seven years for government, so I just wanted to clarify that. Another question that came in related to the FSLG website that I had uh, referenced. It's actually part of the IRS.gov website. So if you go to IRS.gov and then you search within there for FSLG, you'll be able to, it'll take you to the specific section of the IRS website. Uh, another question that came in uh, related to using those verifying websites for, for Social Security numbers and FEIN numbers. Um, yes, I believe that you can verify information that comes in on W-9 for vendors. Um, this is actually a good practice so that your 1099s um, do not uh, come back to you from the IRS that doesn't match the information. So I believe that you can you can um, use those websites for that. Um, the next question relates to um, health care and paying employees who choose not to um, have health care coverage by the employer. Um, the question was, is that taxable? Um, the answer is yes, that would be taxable um, to the employee if you are paying them as a result of them opting to not take the health insurance through, through the employer. Um, the other piece of it, which is somewhat of an extension of the uh, question, is that if you are reimbursing employees or retirees um, for a, an insurance, a medical insurance premium um, that is not part of the employer-sponsored group plan, so if you have an employee who is on Medicare but has supplemental policy, uh, if you are opting to reimburse them for that, that premium that they are paying for that supplemental policy, um, that would be taxable to them um, because it's not part of an employer-sponsored group plan. Um, I have a couple questions here as well, Debbie. Um, an individual asks, can a person be an employee and an independent contractor? That's an interesting one. Oftentimes you have individuals who have a full-time job and perhaps they're doing something else on the side, perhaps an IT person. So they are your full-time IT person. But on the side, they fix computers for friends, they do stuff like that. That's a situation where that would be okay. Where you run into issues is where a person is coming to you to do the work, does not necessarily have an established business on the side, and you're classifying as, them as an independent contractor in order to basically avoid paying benefits, having them have workers comp, you just don't want to deal with whatever it may be. So that's a sticky situation. Technically, though, you cannot hire somebody to be an employee and an independent contractor for you simultaneously. Uh, an individual made a great point here. Um, independent contractor, you should also have a certificate of liability insurance naming you as an additional insured. That's a great point to consider, and thank you for the individual who brought that to the group's attention. Uh, another question here regarding the Fair Labor Standards Act. You said rectify immediately. Would the next payroll you run to make 
a correction comply with immediately? Yes. Uh, basically, they don't expect that you would run a separate payroll to rectify issues. Where you can become having some issues with not complying is ultimately if you're waiting two, three, four, five, six payrolls and you know that there's an issue and you know how to rectify it. So rectifying any issues immediately, doing it on the next payroll is more than appropriate. Um, I have another question here. Is there an overtime exemption for sporting, teaching pros, golf pros, tennis pros? Um, could these jobs be considered professional and therefore exempt? Uh, first, I wish I had one of those jobs. Uh, second, if you go through the Fair Labor, Fair Labor Standards Act and you go through the test, there are exemptions that apply to those certain type of professions. So there's some exemptions, even individuals who are very creative, such as artists, uh, graphic designers, those type of people, there are certain exemptions that would apply. I still would encourage you not to blanket anyone by a title, uh, but more so go through what they're actually doing and what they're responsible for under the Fair Labor Standards Act. Um, another question, rather than docking, can you require exempt employees to use paid time off in increments less than one day? For example, two hours of PTO for a doctor appointment, four hours for leaving ill, et cetera. Yes, that is perfectly acceptable. If you have an established paid time off policy, as long as you're executing it equally across the board and requiring your individuals to take two hours for a doctor appointment, four hours for leaving early, when an individual runs out, of their paid time off. So they have exhausted their allocation for, let's say, the calendar year, and they are out for a partial day. You cannot dock them at that point. You could dock them for a full day absence. So I will have some employers, when someone calls and says, yeah, you know, I'm going to have to only come in for a couple hours today. I have to leave to take my car in and then and go to the dentist. They oftentimes say, hey, look, you know, why don't you just not come in and we're going to have to dock you the day because you've exhausted all your paid time off. But as long as you're following your PTO procedures and they have hours in the bank, it's more than appropriate to take partial day deductions because they're still essentially receiving their full paycheck. It's just being supplemented by paid time off. Debbie, do you have any more questions? Oh, uh, thank you, Joy. Um, we do have some other questions that came in, but unfortunately we're running out of time. So what we would like to do, we have a record of those questions that came in and who submitted the questions. So after the presentation, we will go through those questions and we'll be in contact with those individuals who submitted the questions. Um, so we do thank everybody for joining us today. Uh, on, on your screen right now is the information to contact Joy or I if you have any questions uh, as a result of this presentation. Um, after we sign off today, you will be receiving uh, information with the, the slideshow again, as well as a survey if you would like to uh, complete, if you could complete the survey, that would be great, as well as if you would like CPE, the survey will need to be completed. So thank you all for joining us today. We appreciate it, and we'll talk to you soon. Stay warm. Thank you.